Sorry, I just started right then, but so uh, yes, now we're recording. Yeah. So uh, go introduce yourself and uh, let's know what sure. you're about, my man. Yeah, uh, my name's John Madel. Um, I'm an author and mental health advocate from Ohio. I've written five books about living with mental illness, and uh, those are all available on Amazon uh, in all sorts of forms uh, ebook, paperback, and audiobook. And uh, I was diagnosed in 2006 with bipolar disorder with psychotic features. And later, um, I was diagnosed with anxiety and panic attacks, uh, maybe around like 2009 or 2010. And uh, I have a couple anxiety related disorders like OCD, um, agoraphobia, claustrophobia. Um, I actually have PTSD from the time I spent in the psychiatric unit in 2006. Um, and that was as a result of just basically just being like shocked by what I saw um, and it was an emergency situation. So my mind wasn't all there and like all this stuff was going on around me and I saw some things that were disturbing and, you know, it's been 15 years and I still think about it, you know, every once in a while, it's not as bad, you know, as, as it used to be. Um, but um, so Oh, I have a, a Facebook page. Um, when I started, uh, okay, so in 2006, I was very manic. I was hallucinating. I was psychotic, uh, which is a total break from reality. And they gave me medicine in the hospital in 2006 to bring me way down, like almost, almost into a depressive state. Um, because they needed to bring me down from that high I was feeling. And it took me a, a while to recover from that. Um, when I first got out of the hospital, all I could really do was sleep, eat, and go to the bathroom. And if I took a shower that day, that was like a miracle. That was like, that was like my big hurdle always for a few months maybe even longer it's hard for for me to remember but if i got in the shower that was that was like a big deal you know mm -hmm. wow and uh and and people with bipolar disorder um a lot of them have problems with personal hygiene so it's not just because i was so sedated but you know taking showers just basic personal maintenance cutting your toenails mm. you know stuff like that you know basic self-care stuff yeah it can be really difficult right yeah and uh, yeah i mean that's obviously there's a lot more to it because i wrote for like seven years straight <laughs> i was gonna say um, yeah you uh you sent me graciously sent me over your books i started reading uh the first one i liked i like in the beginning how you're kind of breaking down what these different kinds of uh you know mental conditions are you know you you, you quote straight out of uh the dsmv is it four or five that we're on be so you're right out of that one now and uh breaking down the definitions and things explaining that to the audience too because i mean a lot of these concepts i mean i i come from a medical background i was a paramedic for about 10 years and before i started experiencing you know we were we were, we were well trained i will say on um these mental processes and especially stuff with psychosis and the breaks from reality and, and emergent situations we're very well trained in that but until you've really kind of been through one or experienced it i don't think you can really fully understand it so i like the way that you break it down and kind of explain it in the best possible way to try to bridge that gap between like the the few percent that do have these conditions and then the rest of the world we're trying to live with yeah i mean i would tend to agree with you like i mean i can you can read textbooks about it. I can try to describe it to you. 
But I think the best, you know, unfortunately, the best way to understand it is to go through it. Mm. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I tend to agree with you on that point. Well, that's why I appreciate people like you, too, because, I mean, we got introduced by a friend who knows, like, I'm very, I'm very outspoken about um, my, uh, my mental illnesses or mental conditions, if you want to say it that way. And um, it's something that I started before, before I even realized, I didn't even know I was bipolar at that time. I hadn't been diagnosed, but it was mostly PTSD and depression that I've been struggling with. And um, a lot of that unmanaged stuff from my time on the ambulance that I wasn't processing, I didn't really have the coping mechanisms really built into it. What I would do when I was feeling bad is I would just jump right back on the ambulance and try to, I'd work overtime, I'd pick up shifts, or I'd throw myself into work and I'd, I had no balance. You know, the same thing that was damaging me was what I was turning to to try to fix the damage. And of course, I'm just doing more damage the entire time. So then I started talking about it because I've had friends who've unfortunately succumbed to the dark thoughts of suicide. And I, I found myself in that same position. And I was like, oh, I got to banish this stuff. And so I tried the silent stoic approach, but I just suffered more and more alone. And then finally, I said, I got to talk about this. And I started writing and I started journaling and I started sharing that writing. Because I know I would listen to people who have uh, overcome so much and then they would inspire me to keep going too. And I'm like, I want to put it out there and see if, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not alone feeling this way. And then um, I've, I've been this amazing community and this really, this mental health revolution has really been happening in the last couple of years where people are finally saying like, Hey, no, yeah, I suffer from this stuff too. You're not alone with it. And I think it's yeah. something that's really, really beautiful. And that's why I really appreciate you coming on talking with me about all of this, especially sharing, you know, the fact you've written some books that can help and inspire people too. I'm really stoked to have this conversation. It's actually, I, I think it's an amazing feeling, you know, when you really connect with other people going through similar things and, you know, you tell them, you tell them they're not alone and then they feel better about themselves and their situation. And like, um, I kind of try to be the person I needed in 2006 because, you know, that was 15 years ago, the mental illness, you know, talking about and all that stuff wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't talked about it as much as it is, I think, today. Oh, it was still very taboo. Even five years ago, I would say it is far more taboo than it is today. Yeah. And like when I when I was hospitalized, it was an emergency situation. So I was. I was going through psychosis and like, I didn't, I didn't have the self-awareness to be like, okay, like I have, like, I'm going through this. I have these symptoms. I need to see a doctor. It was like, I, you know, for lack of a better term, I lost my mind and I got into some legal trouble. And then it was like, I was hospitalized and then I like lost all my possessions and it was an emergency situation, you know, like I, you know, I would, I, it, it would have been nicer if I could have been like able to identify that I had a problem, but you know, it, I don't know. Um, it just didn't happen that way. Um, right. Yeah. That's somewhere I feel like I'm very fortunate because having, having had this medical background, having some familiarity and training with a lot of these conditions that I've been diagnosed with now, having, especially when I'm having a panic attack, having that kind of medical background is, is really, really key to helping me break through it. Cause I can break down exactly what's going on. You know, I still feel super panicky and I can't really break that feeling with, you know, easily, but if I can break down what's happening to me physiologically, like, okay, well, my hands are starting to cramp up and they're starting to tingle. Why are they tingling? Oh, cause I'm breathing really fast. Why am I breathing really fast? Well, I'm having this response to my nervous system, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, 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 it's when you can understand why the adrenaline's pumping, and to break that down, it helps me quite a bit too. But I think that coming from a place where if I didn't know what was going on with that, then oh my god, like even 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 the like I'm not gonna say the the average anxiety attack, but even like one of my you know anxiety moments would be far more dramatic and potentially consequential if I didn't know what was going on and be able to identify that. Well, it's it's uh it's funny you should mention that because. I told you that I was diagnosed with panic attacks after I had bipolar for a few years. So 
I didn't know what was happening when I had panic attacks a few times and I would call an ambulance, you know, you feel like you're dying. Right. And, uh, and that was before I was on, uh, like anxiety medication to help with that. And that was before I had coping skills and things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you don't know what it is, it's a scary place, you know, a uh, scary feeling. Um, and I, I still have anxiety and uh, panic attacks and stuff, but there's not like that fear there, like kind of like what you were saying, you know, I have coping mechanisms. It, it's not my first rodeo, you know, like I always say I'm a 15 year veteran now, you know, it's <laughs> it, in July, it'll be 15 years since I was first hospitalized and in, in my newest book, I say every year I survive, it's like a middle finger to my illness, you know, like, and that, you know, that's kind of how I feel sometimes, like, just to be able to get through the day, like, sometimes I got to fire myself up like a, like a football player or something like that. Yeah, like, you got to be your own hype man, yeah. Yeah, right, a uh, hype man. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, well, I do that too, like, there's those days, like, sometimes um like at work especially when i'm feeling real anxious and it's hard for me to focus or get anything done and i've got this racing thoughts and everything just seems kind of hopeless and bleak like i'll tell myself like you are more than your diagnosis like you are still you like you did all of these things spent 10 years on an ambulance like all of that you're bipolar that whole freaking time and you had no idea like just because you know what's going on now doesn't mean you're a slave to it. You can still overcome it and you can still master it. So that's the way I kind of help hype myself up because for me, it's, it's, it's feeling like I don't have control. Like I feel like I can't control my emotion. I feel like I'm, I'm a slave to the whims of my, of my neurodiverse brain. But, but being able to, to stop and say, no, you know, you can still push through this. You can still get these things done or setting little goals for me to accomplish. Even if it's like, like for instance, let's say, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna take a shower today you know some days that's a big accomplishment yeah so yeah i hear you and uh you know for what it's worth like when i was in that depressive state after i first got out of the hospital um i i the way i i got out of it i don't know if it was just a natural thing or whatever but i remember and I don't remember exactly when, but I would read inspirational quotes like uh, it could have been from a philosopher. It could have been from a football coach, anything that was like, you know, like the hype trying to get me hyped up to take showers and get out of bed. And so I started feeding my brain with positivity. And I still I still do that. Uh, I avoid triggers, which. You know, there's a time to face triggers and there's a time when you can just say, okay, it's not like I can avoid this and it's not really a big deal, you know? Right. You, you yeah. can't go, go through life avoiding every little thing that triggers you. But one thing that I absolutely despise is the local news. I will mm. not watch the local news. It triggers me. And, you know, medical dramas on TV. I'm not a big TV person. I listen to a lot of music and I read and I, you know, I'm always trying to promote my books. And, uh, but when I start, I, when I started to come out of the depression, I was like, you know what? I want to try to help people. And um, I started a Facebook page called mental health awareness and online support and we have about 800 members now uh, from about 15 different countries and uh i don't think i've taken a day off of posting in about 10 years so that's awesome I've had the, man. yeah i've had the page for 10 years it's totally free just for anybody struggling i i try to be the hype man for other people i guess you could say yeah and uh you know, I, I'm not, it, it sounds, it sounds strange, but I'm not the most money motivated person. Like if someone comes to me and 
I think they might benefit from reading my books. Like I, I donate a lot of books. Like I'm not a greedy, I'm a very generous person. I, I'm not very money motivated. Um, and uh, I'm actually on disability for bipolar disorder, which I totally admire you that you can hold a steady job. Um, but I, I tried to get approved for disability. It took me seven years to get approved. And in the seven years I had the scrape to, I, I would start a job and then have like, for lack of a better term, a nervous breakdown, or I would have a psychotic episode or, I mean, I tried, you know, I, I, I probably failed it between you know, maybe like five or six different jobs. Mm. And the way we, the way I got approved, you know, we have these lawyers and, you know, they don't get paid unless I win my case. Right. But they were just kind of, they were just kind of messing me around and I didn't like the vibes they were giving off. So I was, I, I had a discussion with my parents and I was like, let's get rid of the lawyers and just, go for it and just be as honest as we can and uh the way i got approved and this is totally to my mom's credit because she told me not to give up and i i felt hopeless after like a year of getting denied you know but the whole time don't give up don't give up so eventually she took my whole case file all my medical records everything that had ever been documented about my illness, which was like a big, a big binder full of stuff, like real thick, you know, Mm -hmm. she, she took it directly to the disability office with a picture of me. And she's like, people are messing us around. Please review this. And like, it, it, it only took a couple of weeks before I was approved. Wow. So once they see everything that you've been through, they're in that physical form. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, this is debilitating for him. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's something yeah. that, that a lot of people, it's 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 tough because they really can, like these conditions cannot be absolutely debilitating. I, I experienced for the first time in my life, the last couple of weeks, like debilitating anxiety, where I would just sit and have this executive dysfunction where I'm just looking at what I need to do. And it's not even that much. It's like putting my laundry away but it just seems like such a daunting, impossible task. I sit there crippled with fear about it. And then the fact that I'm not doing these basic tasks makes me feel terrible about myself. And the whole thing just kind of, it's like, it's just compounds and snowballs. And the next thing you know, you're just miserable and you have no hope for accomplishing anything. You feel like a broken human. Right. And you know, most, most jobs you work, like if you get anxious or you're having trouble, you can't be like, oh, I just need like an hour to like sort my thoughts out and, you know, maybe take a nap or whatever, you know, jobs don't work that way, you know? Right. Yeah. So like, I'm fortunate where I work now, it's a place where they're supportive of me. And like, what I do is like, some, it's more of an office job that I'm working now and I'm not used to that at all. And I'm not, I'm not built for office gigs uh, necessarily, but uh, it's like, what they'll do is like, I bring, um, I'll bring a coloring book for like when I do my lunch, I'll eat lunch real quick. And I'll color a little bit. And then I'll take uh, like every hour or so, at least I try going off for like a little five minute walk, you know, and then, you know, so it, it's, 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 it's very accommodating um, for the most part. But I mean, but there's, there's days too, where like, I'm like, look, I just, I, I can't leave the house today. And I've, I've had yeah. days, I've had days like that too. And like, it's, it's, it's tough with stuff like this because like if my leg's broken, then okay, everyone knows why I'm not going to work. My leg's broken. But if my mind's broken, it's not this visible thing that people are going to do. Because I mean, some people do end up taking advantage of it too. So it can be a difficult, and I also don't want to, I'm also worried that if I, if I need, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get better about self-care, but it's real tough for me because I am, I'm great at advocating for everyone but myself, especially when it comes to taking a day off work or allowing myself to be the human that I am and acknowledge that I've got some issues that need to be worked out in ways that are different than a lot of people's. Yeah, um, you know, again, you're, you're leading me to another point. Um, 
So just recently, I kind of got burned out for a few days because, like I said, I don't think I've taken a day off of advocating in like 10 years. So, you know, I'm promoting my books. I'm trying to help people that come to me. I'm doing the page. And it's like, I'm just like immersed in my illness. And there's so much more to me than that and my personality and I, I I've been I was so burned out for a few days and I was like all right I like I need to find some hobbies that have nothing to do with mental illness advocating or writing or whatever so um <laughs> which are you know even keeping concentration to do a hobby which is fun like coloring, like you mentioned, that's a great relaxation tool for people like us, right? Oh yeah. So I bought so I bought an artistry set, like paint and brushes and canvases. And my brother had an old easel and I haven't I, I've I set it up like two days ago. I haven't done a painting yet, but I'm really looking forward to just zoning out, you know, maybe whatever, put some music on and just trying to tune out everything and i do that with music too i'm big in music like i said and you know i wish i could read but i don't know if you have this trouble but it's hard to concentrate to actually read i have to do it in short bursts yeah, yeah. I, I can't sit for a lot I can't, it's hard for me to sit for a long time and really focus on anything anymore so what yeah. i'll do is i'll set up like little like little different like hobby stations almost like i'll have one where i'm painting like a little minifigure for like my D, &D campaign another one where i've got some coloring stuff out another one i've got my ukulele i might play a little bit of music but like i jump between these different things i'll play xbox for 20 minutes you know and but it's it's like something that i um that i read in uh in, in your book too he's like i'm talking about how it's difficult for you to even pay attention to like a tv show you yeah. know and it's, it's something that's very difficult for me too to sit and look like through a whole show and i like, feel a focus on it usually i'll start tapping on my phone or I'll get up, start doing something. So like I have to have like I, I go back to a comfort show. My comfort show is Bob's Burgers. I go back to that and I've seen it so many times through. I know every line of like every episode. So it's just kind of a comfort thing in the background. And like I still find it funny, which helps out, too. But like it's one of those things where it's just it's on. I know what it is. It's something that's safe. There's no triggers in it for me. And it's just kind of there to provide me some comfort and background noise. But like, I can't sit and like just watch something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can't make it through a whole TV show. I, I really don't, you know, that's kind of like a popular thing to do with Netflix and everything. And it's just not me. I, I, I wish I could like zone out for eight hours, you know, or whatever. Oh yeah, dude. I'm all, I'm all Netflix I wish. no chill. <laughs> yeah. Right. And actually, um, um, I, I, I love sports. I'm a big sports guy and I can't sports is one of those things that you can kind of tune in and out. And, mm -hmm. um, it, I, I much more enjoy sports than any kind of like sitcom or anything like that. Um, and you know, every, everybody's different, but, uh, man, I had a great point, <laughs> oh, no but worries. anyway, I, I'll remember eventually. It'll come back. To oh, 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 I got it. I got it. I got it. So I've told this to a lot of people. I try to keep a sense of humor. Like it brings me joy to make other people laugh. I love reading stuff that makes me laugh. Kind of like your Bob's Burgers show. Yeah. And it's something I really get a kick out of. And I tell people I take my sense of humor very seriously. <laughs> um like if i'm not joking around like you know it's really hard for me to be serious at this point because i've just been you know i make fun of myself you know like it's it's just like this whole issue you know it's yeah. just something i it's just something i do to cope like i love reading funny stuff short little video clips and stuff like that and so I think keeping a sense of humor is good, whether you're mentally ill or not, because, mm -hmm. you know, what life can life happens sometimes. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, 
trying to trying to uh, keep a sense of humor and a grateful heart and trying to stay inspired and all that stuff. Those are good coping skills, you know, whether you have a mental illness or not. Yeah, like I used to always say, like about having a sense of humor, especially, you know, when you're up against a lot of adversity or something I would say a lot in the first responder community and to my other, you know, coworkers and friends. Um, I'd always say like being able to laugh at stuff is extremely important because if you can laugh in the face of death, then it can never overcome you. You know, and if you can yeah. laugh in the face of, of some of these disabilities and you can laugh in the face of all of the terrible hands life deals you, then there's there's hope for you because there's hope for you to overcome it for sure. I mean, there's even an episode in Scrubs that talks about how important humor is um, to to coping. And I think that's one of the most profound things that show did was really put that human element of saying like, you know, like humor, it's not all just um, levity and, and silliness. Like it really is a serious coping mechanism. That's extremely effective for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, know if the same is true for paramedics, but, uh, I dated a nurse a long time ago and nurses have some, dark senses of humor uh and oh yeah and it, you know it's hard for someone not in the healthcare emergency emt paramedic world you know yeah but but i mean my, my niece is a nurse and you know uh she lives out of town i don't get to see her much but it just seems like well let me first say i love nurses just they saved my life. I dated one. I have friends that are nurses that are great people. I always just say I love nurses. So, um, but, you know, I know they say some real dark stuff to each other. You know, I'm glad they don't spill it on me because I wouldn't be able to handle it. But yeah, a couple of yeah. things you learn early on to an emergency medical career. You learn gallows humor and you learn to read your audience. <laughs> <laughs> Because like people, well, there's always that question. People always want to know, like, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? And like, oh, hey, I'm not going to relive my trauma for you over at. Yeah, Mount you're Spank. not supposed to. Ask. That's one of those things you don't ask. It's taboo. Know? Yeah. But so I would I would deflect it, though. They'd be like, what's the worst thing you've ever seen as a paramedic? And I would say my paycheck. <laughs> and then try funny. to, yeah, inject a little bit of humor into it and talk about that. Because, you know, I like, I like advocating for EMS as well. You know, you have a lot of people who are doing a lot of work for very little pay and some rough conditions. So I like to do that as well when I get a chance. I have a lot of, you know, former medics on the podcast. Like my last episode was a former medic and a veteran talking about a coast to coast ride he's doing for uh, PTSD. And he's going to be writing some local protocols to help out with mental health for the entire county. So there's some really, like when I said mental health revolution earlier, like I really meant it, like they were making some amazing progress and the other people like you advocating for us too. It's, it's just, it's really encouraging to see. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if the common or if the general population realizes that people who haven't been in the military can have PTSD. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it happens a lot to, like, um, physical and sexual abuse victims. Just any any kind of trauma, basically, that scars you, uh, you know, can cause PTSD. But um, I, I know some veterans, they have PTSD. I have the utmost respect for veterans. And uh, if I can ever help them... You know, I, I do my best to help them. Um, so uh, I had a veteran friend. He has PTSD and bipolar disorder. And he bought all my books. Super cool guy. And uh, um, the my books got into the hands of one of his relatives. And this certain relative didn't speak to him for the longest time because she thought he was making up, he was fabricating mental illness or the way he felt. Mm. And, she, and she read my books and she was just like, oh my God. And now she like calls him every day. Like, how, how are you doing, dude? Like, you know, and stuff like that, man. It's, it goes back to the 
the rewarding aspects of sharing your story, you know? And I've noticed that too, because one thing I was really, really terrified of when I left uh, emergency medical services was I was terrified I'd never get that kind of rush again, you know, like that rush where you know you just help someone in such a visceral way. I was really, really worried that I wasn't going to have that because, I mean, it's addicting. That dopamine rush, the adrenaline <laughs> rush, it's absolutely addicting. And then it turns out I've got a brain where I'm addicted to dopamine anyway, because I barely fucking get any of it. But um, it's... Uh, but then oh, I started sharing my story and talking to people and then having other people on to share theirs too and giving a platform to people to really relate and understand each other. When I get feedback, that comes back to me saying like, like someone reached out and saying how much I've helped them by talking about this stuff or, you know, I mean, I'm sure you experienced that same kind of rewarding or feeling, especially like, like that story you just told, like that's gotta be so heartwarming and amazing. Yeah. And that's actually the first time I've ever mentioned it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just whatever, whatever embarrassment I'm sacrificing or, you know, being an open book, privacy, whatever privacy I'm sacrificing doesn't compare to the reward that I get. So, you know, sometimes I'll like, I'll think to myself, like, like, wow, like pretty much everyone knows your story. Like, it's not... It, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have too many skeletons in my closet, man. It's all in my books. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I wonder if I want that privacy back, but man, I just, I look at the road, the road I've paved in the last 15 years. And it's just, you know, like I said, whatever sacrifice I've made of, uh, in terms of privacy or embarrassment is come back to me tenfold so it's you know it's it is you know and i love that you take pride in that like i really really am because that's something that i worry about myself um i mean i i talk about pretty much everything like i just admitted you know for the umpteenth time that you know i was suicidal at one point and it's happened more than once where i've been that way and it's 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 scary putting it out there because there is still a stigma to quite a bit of this kind of thing, especially from those that aren't understanding as much. But I think that it's important to have these conversations because that's what breaks down that stigma. That's what makes us more relatable. Like, like I said, like I've only unfortunately had the I've only time so far to read the beginning of your book, but the way you break stuff down into what these different disorders are and the way that we perceive the world um, differently than a lot of other people. I think it's going to bridge that gap quite a bit. Like you, I mean, we already know for at least one case where you did bridge that divide, where you help someone understand that. So I think what you're doing with that is really, really important. And actually kind of ties into the next question I wanted to ask you. So what inspired you to actually get in there and write these books? Oh, I, well, I know I can give you a definitive answer for my first book. Um, it was out of desperation. Uh, I didn't, I felt so bad. I didn't know if I was going to survive. And I wanted my story to be told, uh, you know, in, in case anything ever happened. Mm. And uh, that's where the first book came from. I mean, it was total desperation. I was just like, I need to get this down. It's going to be around if I, if anything happens. Um, and then I, maybe I just got addicted to the, the release or the coping that it gave to me and then i went on i just kept writing it was like for like seven years every day you know i'd make a little entry here and there and turn into five books so that's awesome man i definitely i definitely want to make sure we plug the books and give them give them plenty of time to you know for people to, to reach out to them and find them if they want to purchase them so what are the uh, sure. what are the titles and uh and just give your name one more time I mean, we'll do an outro later on too, but uh, just because I'm on the topic, I want people to think about it and uh, see it. So you can just search my name on Amazon. Uh, my last name is spelled M-E-D-L, four letters. Uh, my books will come up. Like I said, there's five of them, all sorts of formats. If you're not a reader, there's audio books. Um, Did you do the audio yeah. for it? No. No. Uh, <laughs> No, I actually hired a female to do it, which I wasn't sure if it was going to be strange uh, since I'm male, she's female, 
but she did she did an excellent job. It, it it's fluid. It totally works. Her voice is much better than mine. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. You got a decent radio voice. It's good for podcasting, yeah, at the very least. I have a good voice, uh, but I, I, I just didn't. I didn't want it to be in my own voice, and I don't know if I have a good answer for why not. Um, That's fair, though. I understand that. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, <laughs> I've told people this before. I've never read my books. Um, I proofread them before they were published, but I've never been like, oh, like, oh, look what I did. Like, yeah, well, well, it's hard for me to read, but it's more hard for me to revisit that stuff. That's what I was going to ask about kind of reliving some of the stuff you're writing about. Right. And, uh, and it, it goes along with getting burned out, you know, like I talk about myself enough. I don't need to read, you know, <laughs> I'm telling you my story right now. I don't need to read about it. You know, it's and you know your story. Yeah. 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 That makes absolute sense. So so after stuff for the first one out of the desperation, you started seeing some of the response, get some of the feedback. You decided to just keep on going with it. And it's a good outlet too. Was it kind of a combination yeah. of both? Like a good outlet for you to kind of express yourself. And then also you realize, oh, I'm helping people at the same time. It's a win-win. Yeah, right. It was uh there were definitely like several benefits to putting it in print um i started to get feedback and it was just like this self-feeding positive energy and then my second book is the odd one out it's a poetry book and i had all these poems that i had written uh both pre and post diagnosis and i had them like in a notebook and i was just like these are pretty good like I think I could make a book out of these too. <laughs> so I wrote a poetry book and after every poem, I write like a paragraph explaining uh, where my head was at when I wrote it. Um, because poetry can be confusing sometimes because it's a, it's a creative art, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted people to, to know what I was talking about when I was writing, you know, why what the poems were about afterwards. So I remember I wrote a poem while I was having a panic attack because I wanted to capture that energy and that feeling. And it's just, you know, I, it, it was hard to even sit still and type it, you know? Oh, I'm sure. And, and, and you, I think, I, I think you mentioned sitting still earlier in our conversation i have the same trouble like i'm i'm constantly up and down you know i'm a smoker so i'll go outside i need to get some fresh air um i you know i like cook like cooking like i'm just i don't have like stations like you were talking about but mm. like i have several different things i can do when i have that nervous manic energy where i can't sit still um and i fidget <laughs> yeah i pull so my shirt you know yeah i've been doing I, the same thing i'm, I'm like going back and forth i'm wiggling around a little bit yeah, man, yeah I'm, on that, that, I'm on that same wave like with you my man it's it's kind of funny well it it's not funny because it's actually very um i don't know the word for it disturbing to like realize like you're tugging at your shirt and you can't really help it. And, you know, I readjust my hat all the time. And I'll but, catch myself you know. doing it and I'll be like, okay, are you nervous about something? Is there actually like a threat or something you're anxious about? Or are you just kind of nervous energy? And half the time it's just nervous energy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, they even, uh, I think this goes along more with like ADD and ADHD, but they're having kids like, bounce around on one of those gym balls like while they're learning like because kids heard, can't sit, yeah for people yeah. do that like at workstations and like kind of not only is it a good way to like kind of get out some of that energy but it's also fairly decent ab workout from what i understand right so the ultimate irony is that i have a degree in psychology oh really <laughs> which i always think is kind of funny um so i graduated from the university of Dayton in 2004 
and I was hospitalized in 2006. And when I was taking my psychology classes, I remember I had a professor named Dr. Reeb for abnormal psychology. And the first day he said, first of all, I want you to know there's no such thing as normal. That's awesome. <laughs> so that was, that was one funny thing that one of my teachers said. Another professor, I had Professor Pazella in Psych 101, he said, now we're going to be reading about a lot of different disorders and you're going to think you have all of them. <laughs> yep. But you don't, trust me. <laughs> and I, the most ironic thing is that I'm reading all these textbooks about mental disorders and I had no clue. I, you know, I, I, I've probably showed signs since high school and even maybe as a kid. And I was just totally clueless that, you know, one day I might have to be medicated for mental illness. And I mean, I, it's not because it's not from lack of knowledge or anything. It's, I don't know. It's hard Maybe. to apply that lens to yourself. Yeah, like, you it's know. interesting looking back at like like now looking back at like past behaviors and stuff like that. I can chart like when I was manic, when I was depressed, when I was manic depressed. Like I can look back and see like, oh, I see the inner workings now. Now looking back with that lens, but when you're in the midst of it or before you realize you have a diagnosis or something like that, you're it's, it's easy for it to all slip by and not and not be noticed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was, it was hard, it was, it would have been hard to recognize because I was always very social, I was always kind of the life of the party, I, I had tons of friends, I still have tons of friends, but um, I mean, I was just kind of always high energy, you know, I mean, I don't know, I always think an interesting question is, where does your pet personality end and where does your illness start? You know what I right. mean? Like, yeah. It's like, it's like, I don't, I don't know if it's really helpful to think about it that way because like, you know, we label it as an illness, but in the end it's part of who I am. So like, even though I was manic and unmedicated and kind of being wild and stuff, I mean, that's who I was, you know, it's, I mean, there's some stuff that you can be like, like, yeah, I was definitely manic, out of control, psychotic, whatever you want to call it. Hmm. But I mean, as far, as far as like being the life of the party, like if I didn't have bipolar disorder, I probably would have been the same way anyway. So, right. Yeah. You know, it's just, I don't know. It's, I, I, I think it's just more interesting. Like you said, like, now that you know, like looking back, like I think the same things about a lot of stuff I did, like, like, wow, like, yeah, I was manic, like, or like, wow, you know, I have, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but there's bipolar one and bipolar two, right? Yep. I am a bipolar one. Yeah. So am I. So yep. like, we want to, we're the more hyper kind, right? You know, more prone to, more prone to mania and not as, the depressive states don't usually last as long. Right. So, like I said, man, I've always just been high energy, getting fired up for no reason or whatever. And um, so, yeah, but the the uh, wrench or the wild card in the situation was the psychotic features. Um, that's like a branch of having bipolar one. So, like I was... I was psychotic, which means I was going through psychosis, which means it's basically the way that um, people would just say you lost your mind or you went crazy. So I like the, the break from reality, like you mentioned before. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, and I hate the word crazy. I hate the word normal. But um, it's what other people would say, like, oh, he went crazy. Like, that's what happened. And uh mm. I don't, you know, some people with bipolar don't have that. So that's why there's a distinction there. 
Yes, fortunately, I, I haven't had any episodes like that. But I mean, every time I talk to my psychiatrist, she's like, hey, are you hallucinating? Are you sleeping OK? Have you had any big dissociative episodes, stuff like you that, feel like you, you know? Fly. Yeah, stuff like that. So like yeah. I, I'll, I'll dissociate a bit, but I've never had like that hard break from reality that would classify me into that subcategory of the bipolar one. Um, Fortunately, but I mean, I've definitely I've, I've had a lot of patients who have been in that state and, you know, with it's, it's as close as I can get to it without having experienced it. It's, it seems like such a terrifying experience. I mean, it, it just seems like so, so debilitating. It's uh, it's kind of like watching yourself in, an, in a movie and someone else is at the controls. Do you feel okay. kind of like aware of what's going on? Not so much like your motivation for doing it, but like, are you watching like, oh my God, what did I just do? But then you keep doing stuff or is it more just kind of you're just oh, going no. through in the moment then you look totally, back later? Totally oblivious. You're running on pure instinct, mm. pure, you know, whatever hallucinations or whatever you're having, you're just running on pure instinct. And like, you actually have to, somehow snap out of it to really be able to look back and you know say oh that was psychosis because when you're in it you you, you you're not self-aware enough you know it's like i mean i don't really know how to describe it except you lose your mind like everything you start hallucinating you think this or that and they're and it's all not real. It's not reality. And uh, yeah, it's it's a very strange thing to go through. But you know, it, it and it's. I guess it. I guess I was scared when I was going through psychosis, because I was also probably manic at the same time, mm -hmm. and. Like I said, I, I didn't know when I was first hospitalized, they said, um, they called it my first break. And I don't know if that refers to a break from reality or whatever, but they said my brain in, uh, took damage similar to a car accident. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was just like, when I was hospitalized, my brother was the one who drove me to the hospital, but I was like doing all these things that was like manic and psychotic, and he's like, you know, I think you need to lay down, and I laid down, and I heard, I can't describe it anything other than it sounded like trumpets were blaring. Hmm. and I I like I thought angels were talking to me and stuff and it felt like my my head was like cracking in half wow. and uh and I you know first break is an accurate way to describe it if you're talking about the way my head felt so you know it was just like super painful which brings me to another point a lot of people don't realize that mental illness has physical symptoms you know mm -hmm. they, they, they think it's all in your head but you know when you talk about anxiety you were talking about the symptoms you had sweating you know some like we were just talking about can't sit still you know chest pains and and i have a funny word of advice don't read about panic attacks when you're having a panic attack <laughs> no yeah no it's one of the worst <laughs> ideas ever for sure yeah. i uh yeah fortunately i had a little training in panic attacks before all that so i was able to track it all in my own but even then like i overthought it then too because i'm like you know what I, like, i'm pretty sure i'm having a panic attack but holy shit this is awful i remember the first one yeah. i had I, I i finally got to the point where i'm like oh my god that's what's going on i'm having a full-blown physically manifesting panic attack and i'm like well shit okay well how can i kind of break this down how can i talk myself through it and what i ended up doing was i ended up calling a buddy um a buddy mike he's been on the podcast before he uh, in emt as well but he's dealt with this kind of stuff before he experienced it you know anecdotally he was able to really coach me through 
like, okay, well, look at what's real, kind of bring it back to reality, try to try to keep me from going into some of those breaks. I don't know if I have no idea if it's something you can kind of start to see coming and maybe prevent now that you've been through it before, or if it's just, it well, happens and that's it. I don't know what uh, well, experience I, that is for you. Well, uh, they, they actually call that technique grounding. Um, you try to pick out like things you can, um, like things you can see, hear, touch. You basically look for things that are real right in front of you to focus on um to kind of bring kind of snap you back to reality and then i've also a nurse told me one time uh uh inhale she said inhale the smell of flowers and blow out the birthday candles as a way to remind yourself to breathe you know deep mm. breath and actually, the deep breaths force your brain to stop sending those panic signals. So it, it calms you down, you know, just mm. in, in through your nose, out through your mouth. And I use all this stuff because, you know, like I said, I'm not. It's hard to say that I'm I mean, they're they're scary for sure, but I'm not as scared as I used to be because <clears throat> i know what they are right um but i mean they're still fairly terrifying <laughs> oh i'm sure yeah you know? I mean, even though you know what they are it's like you know you're still like cramping up or whatever else happens and you still have that feeling of like impending doom that you just can't shake sometimes like that feeling will linger even once the physiological symptoms subside if you want to get the breathing back on track and you slow stuff down that feeling of doom can linger for for a good deal afterwards i've never had it last more than an hour but like still like that feeling that got you there in the first place still hanging out it's it's tough yeah for sure John, I could talk with you for uh, a lot longer. I want to have you back on sometime for sure. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, if there's anything else, please plug that that group again. I would love to join it. In fact, too. It's uh, it's called Mental Health Awareness and Online Support. Fantastic. Uh, and then uh, John John Madel M E D L E or A B D L. Yeah, four letters. Four letters, M-E-D-L. Um, look on Amazon, look out for that audiobook read by the uh, lovely voice actress you hired. Um, right. dude, uh, and thank you again. I'm looking forward to digging more into your books. And uh, I really, really appreciate you. And I think you're doing some really awesome work. And I think that it's uh, it's really important. I'm really, uh, really proud. So for you, my man. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on here and talking with me. Absolutely, man. And uh, all of you listening, thank you so much for listening. Um, it's been another conversation that hopefully cuts through some noise for all of you. And I know that uh, anytime I feel a little bit less alone with all this craziness, I know it's been a good day. And it's a great reminder that anyone listening out there, you think you're having some, some issues, you're feeling isolated, you're not alone. There's a lot of us, we're a small percentage, but we're a mighty percentage. There's a lot of us out there who are going through the same kind of stuff and you are not alone. There are resources out there. No one can get through this stuff alone. That's why we're here too. So love you all. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening, John. Thank you again so much. And I will talk to you all next week. Bye everybody.